Hello there, today I'll be talking to you about Checking Out My History, which is a poem by John Agard. So, the first thing we need to know is that Agard comes from British Guyana, um, which is a colony uh, at the top of the South American continent on the Caribbean Sea. Um, and what you can see here is a map of the British Empire in the 1920s, um, and that what we can see from looking at a little bit of the history here of Guyana is that the colonial presence, the uh, presence of white European settlers, really dominates the history. Um, so it's first conquered by the Dutch in 1796. Uh, it's then captured by the British and named British Guyana in 1831. Where the British then transformed Guyana into sugar plantations and start to import West African slaves um, through the transatlantic slave trade to work there. Uh, and then independence doesn't come until the 26th of May 1966, when Guyana becomes an independent country of its own right. So if we then look at John Agard in relation to this, he's born in 1949 in British Guyana, so still, uh, he's born there when it's still a member of the British Empire. He begins writing poetry in the sixth form while he's there and, and publishes two books while still in Guyana. Uh, he moved to Britain in 1977, um, predominantly to work for the BBC. He's continued to write poetry in Britain and lots of his work is concerned with educating people about Caribbean culture uh, and history. And some of the problems that he's faced coming from a country that has such a strong colonial history um, and presence. So if we just very quickly look at some more aspects of Guyana history. Uh, Guyana history, <clears throat> up until its independence in 1966, is one of um, oppression, uh, slavery and domination. So what we can see here, sugar plantations of Guyana um, and slave markets, all of which would have been uh, predominant um, in the colony uh, for 60, 70 years at least whilst the, while it was used as a sugar plantation. Um, and I think that that leads us interestingly onto some of the, um, some of the issues that we have seen arising in Britain and around the world relating to slavery. Uh, in Bristol over the weekend, this happened, which is the toppling of a statue which was still held in esteem in Bristol, which is of a um, slave trader, uh, and that was ripped down. And I think what we can see is this idea of the UK not being innocent in its treatment of minorities, but especially um, people of uh, black uh, African origin who were transported around the world as a result of slavery and who are still treated uh, in a way that is derogatory and um, and second class uh, in many of these former slave-owning countries and states. Um, so if we now think about the poem itself, this is what I want us to think about predominantly as we look at today's lesson, and that's that the poem links identity with the importance of having knowledge of your own cultural and racial roots. And identity is a really central idea in this poem. It's also a central idea in the power and conflict collection as a whole. And I know something that the other teachers who have done these presentations have been talking to you about, linking that idea to the, the poems that they've been discussing. So I want you to really think about this idea of identity as we move through the rest of the analysis of the poem. Now, there's some other things that come up as we, we want to be thinking about when we're looking at the poem. One is that the speaker implies that history he has been taught is not representative of his identity. And that's the ideas about British colonial control and about what we teach people and how that shapes the way that they see themselves. The speaker is angry that black culture and history have been neglected and dismissed. I think as we start to engage the poem, what we'll see is comparisons being made consistently between white British colonial history or and that of um, black, Caribbean, African um, 
or European histories that are neglected uh, to be taught because of the prominence of the uh, white European history um, and that its central position within um, British educational system. Uh, the poem can be interpreted as encouraging self-empowerment and pride in one's culture. Um, and I think the reason that the poem focuses so much on self-empowerment is because of the lack of empowerment that Agard feels his own culture is given by the British colonial presence that he was edu educated under. The last thing I want you to think about is this. The poem suggests that the process of education involves people being, in, people being given information by those who have power and authority. And you, it's an interesting thing to think about is that all education comes from those people that control what they want us to learn and how that affects the way that we see the world or we see ourselves, especially in this poem and for Agard. So here we are, uh, checking out my history. Um, now, hopefully what you've done is you've listened to the fabulous reading of this by John Agard, the lyric uh, and passionate reading that um, I attached to go with this PowerPoint. Um, I'm not going to read the poem to you because I think it will detract from the power of hearing it in the native dialogue and accent that, that um, Agar reads it in. So what we're going to do is we will go now straight on to thinking about the structure and the language um, of the poem itself. And before we do that, though, what we need to look at is some of the stars of this poem. So first we have Toussaint Louverture, um, who is mentioned in the first uh, verse about a god educating himself. Toussaint Louverture is a former slave who rose to become leader of the only successful slave revolt in modern history uh, in Haiti. Uh, he's the eldest son of an African prince who had been captured by slaves and made to work on a Caribbean plantation. Louverture managed to secure his freedom at the age of 20 due to his great intelligence and skill as a horseman. However, this did not stop him from being, helping to lead other slaves in rebellion against their slave masters. Um, a fabulous military tactician, uh, someone of in, a highly, intelli uh, highly intelligent um, and sophisticated in the way that he looked at military strategy, defeated the French in Haiti, um, and, and, and just a, an incredible person when it comes to the history of Caribbean freedom for um, the black peoples who were transported there. So the next person that's mentioned is uh, Nanny D. Maroon. So Nanny D. Maroon is a leader of the Maroons, uh, African people living in Jamaica. So slaves transported by the transatlantic slave trade um, to work in the plantations. Uh, so at the beginning of the 18th century, she was um, known by both the Maroons and the British settlers that lived in Jamaica as an outstanding military leader who became in her lifetime and after a figure of unity and strength for her people during times of crisis. Um, she's actually credited with creating uh, some of the first principles of guerrilla warfare where she took the Maroon people um, into the mountains of Jamaica and fought the British, um, drew them into the jungles and fought them uh, in those situations. Um, she's particularly important to her people in the fierce fight with the British during the First Maroon War from 1720 to 1739. So again, uh, another really significant person in the liberation and the freedom and the empowerment of black peoples within the Caribbean and someone else who Agar thinks is central to his understanding of his Caribbean identity. Then we have Mary Seacole. So Mary Seacole left her home in Jamaica and went to the Crimean War in 1854, uh, much the same as Florence Nightingale, obviously, an incredibly famous and prominent person in the um, medical history of Britain. Uh, and she went there to help British soldiers. When battles were raging, she gave out food, blankets, clean clothes and medical care. And the soldiers called her Mother Seacole. So even though she was rejected uh, racially by by Britain, even though she was advised not to go, she travelled anyway because she thought that it was her responsibility, a place to go and support um, British soldiers. So what we can see is three incredibly um, iconic and important members of the Caribbean, uh, Caribbean history 
the Agod highlights as um, representative of his own identity um, and culture throughout the poem. So now, um, what we want to be thinking about here are some of the main ideas in the poem. So firstly, it makes the reader aware that British history is only a point of view told from a white European standpoint. Um, and that's something that I think is relevant for us all to consider when we learn um, aspects of uh, British history. Uh, it introduces the readers to historical black figures of central importance to both the Caribbean but also to British history, people like Mary C. Cole, very important uh, in the Crimean War. Reminds us that whatever, whoever controls the past controls the present. And I think that that is a really important statement to think about, that the people that control information control our understanding of events, and that that's an incredibly powerful position to be in. The poem itself uses two types of stanzas to show the differences between official and non-official history. And what we can see is that one is the British, the official history, and then we have a sort of an italicised, more free verse type of poetry that Agard employs to teach us the non-official, the history that he's had to discover for himself about black uh, Caribbeans. He writes in a colloquial dialect, so that just means that he uses his own voice and he doesn't change it in order to conform to a more uh, common or more um, correct way of pronunciation. Um, it's also a, he also does not use punctuation, and both are a rejection of the control of language by the white British elite. Coming from Caribbean, you have a certain accent, you have a certain dialect, and constantly being told that this is less than um, a, a sort of BBC received British accent um, is one of the things that Agard rejects and rallies against. <laughs> So um, he, what he does is he shows that without a true history and without a distinctive voice, we may have no identity. And so that by not being allowed to fully explore his history and culture, he is stopped from having a real identity about um, his Caribbean heritage. So now let's look at the language of the poem itself. So he starts with this, these three lines, dem tell me, dem tell me, or dem want to tell me. Um, so first of all, we can see that the colloquial dialect here is employed. We've got dem dem uh, wa dem, uh, and using his own accent and rejecting traditional ideas about English and the English language is a really powerful way to start this poem. And the repetition of the, of dem um, denoting them, so it's it's an, it's people informing a god, repressing a god with their own ideas rather than him being allowed to discover. Uh, his own history and culture, like I've said. So then we've got the repetition, um, which uses the imperative, uh, which just means to, that it's a command. It's, it's them tell me, which shows the lack of control Agar had uh, due to the colonial oppression over his own identity. It's not I discovered, it's they tell me. And um, that brings us to the last line of this opening stanza, which is what them want to tell me. Uh, and this line defines the power that someone has over your identity if they control what you learn and what knowledge you could possess of your heritage and culture. Uh, and, and I really want you to think about that as uh, being him being almost restricted from learning about uh, black Caribbean history because of the way that uh, the British, in this sense, want to control how he sees his heritage and culture. So if you move to the next stanza, we see this. Yeah, we see Agard starting to employ metaphor here to talk about the way that he has been stopped from knowing himself and his own identity. So the first thing we see is that the metaphors uh, referencing blindness are used to show how Agard has been kept naive and unaware of his own identity. So we've got this bandage up my eye, we've got me blinding him to his own identity and it's that idea that through his education actually he is becoming less knowledgeable about himself. What we can see is that Agard starts to try and cure this blindness by learning more about black Caribbean culture and history, which allows him to see himself for the first time. And I think that, that idea of um, sight uh, being induced or being created by 
a real perception of his history and culture is really important uh, in this poem for Ego. So now, if we then move on, uh, what I've done is I've broken the poem down um, into these three sections. So these three sections, um, they come and what they do is they inform us about the sort of things that Agard was taught at school and the importance placed on those things. So the stanzas deal with things that he was taught by the British about history and culture. Now, what I think is really interesting here is that they each start with historical fact about white British history. So we've got 1066, the Battle of Hastings. Um, we've got the invention of the hot air balloon. And we've got Florence Nightingale and her lamp. And so these are, I guess, things that were taught with a certain prominence to Agard, um, historical facts. But if you notice, uh, none of these bear any reference to the Caribbean, to uh, slavery, to uh, British colonialism, to the empire, things that were pertinent to his own life and connection to British history are not the sorts of things that are being taught. Then what we see is that the next detail is actually nursery rhymes and stories, which are themselves even things that are made up since uh, Dick Whittington, uh, the cow that jumped over the moon, uh, and the dish that ran away with the spoon. Then you see that Robin Hood and old King Cole. And so that these nursery signs and stories are given more prominence uh, and considered more important than learning about the reality of black Caribbean history and those people central to it. And I think there's a sense of irony here where Agard tries to draw out this idea that we don't learn about Toussaint Leverture, we don't learn about Nanny de Maroon, we don't learn about Mary Seacole, but he was taught British nursery rhymes about make-believe and invention that was seen as more prominent to his life than learning about powerful black uh, leaders and um, people of prominence within his own community um, and within his own black Caribbean culture. And I think the other thing to notice, which is really important about these lines, is again, we've got the repetition here of, of them tell me. Um, and that's reinforced throughout the poem just to show us as the reader uh, the real control that the British have over Agard and his ability to understand himself. So then we have this really important verse um, and this one is important because the stanza offers us a direct comparison between the, the colonial white history and black history. So here we have Lord Nelson on Waterloo referenced against uh, Shaka Zulu. Um, and again, we've got Columbus in 1492, and that is compared with the, Carib the Caribs and the Arawaks. Now, what's really interesting is if we break that down a little bit. So if you look at the first one where he compares Lord Nelson, who is a British naval hero, um, he is the person on top of the statue, um, on Nelson's column in Trafalgar Square. He ha had a famous victory at Waterloo. Um, so he's very prominent within British European history. But then what Agar does is he contrasts him with Shaka Zulu, uh, who's one of the most influential leaders of the Zulu nation uh, of Southern Africa, a unifier of his people, um, someone who was both military leader, but also um, a highly intelligent politician. Uh, and again, you see what we what we are what Agard is arguing is that Nelson and Waterloo and the prominence to sort of white British history means that he was never given access to learn about uh, Shaka Zulu and um, native African leaders uh, who might have given him a sense of pride in his uh, in his blackness and his African roots. And then we have this probably the most stark comparison in the poem in terms of the sort of Car um, history of the Caribbean. Um, because this is a direct comparison between the impact of colonialism in the Caribbean region and the indigenous inhabitants. So Agar compares Columbus discovering the Americas. Uh, and remember that the first place that Columbus lands is in the Caribbean. And the question of what happened to the native peoples of the region, the Arawaks and the Caribs, who were almost entirely wiped out uh, 
by those British, um, Dutch, uh, Portuguese, Spanish settlers who first came to the Caribbean. Um, and what is sad, the saddest part of that is that they have given their name to the Caribbean. So they live on in, um, in the name of it, but in terms of our understanding of their position within the history, um, and also this sort of genocidal, the, 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 mur the murder of a, of a vast array of indigenous people by those first European settlers who came to the Caribbean and took it over. And so I think that that comparison there, that he learns about the white Europeans that came to the Caribbean for the first time, but not the people who had been there for centuries before it and whose home it really is. So again, um, what I've done here is I've broken the poem down, and what we've what I've presented you with are the three verses, the one about Toussaint Leverture, Nanny de Maroon, and Mary Seacole. Um, and so these, after every stanza about the history forced on him, Agar places a stanza written in a very different style about Black Caribbean history. Uh, so what he does in these stanzas uh, about Black Caribbean history is that these are the things he, he shows us that these are the things he's had to learn himself. They're italicized so that they stand out visually, physically almost from the British colonial teachings. It's like Agard wants us to see the poem as two starkly different views of the world. And, and, and the physical change in the poem is a representation of that. The lines are shorter. They're written in free verse. And what Agard does is he uses an unconventional form, a rejection of more traditional European poetic forms, to write about unconventional ideas, ideas that maybe the British uh, didn't want him to know or weren't willing to teach him. And so lastly, what we can see here is that the sections are filled with metaphor and positive imagery to convince the reader about how significant and positive these people are. Um, and I think that that's a real, po that's a real um, purposeful choice by Agard when it comes to the way that he wants to present these people. Um, n like a reinvention of how uh, important and significant they are to him and to the understanding of the Caribbean. And so what we can see here is that at the bottom of the Toussaint Leverture, we've got the metaphor of him being a thorn to the French and a beacon. And so again, a beacon is a light, a bright light that, that leads someone somewhere or signifies something. So I think we can see there this positive idea, the positivity that he was a problem to the white colonial presence and the, the, and the positivity of the, that, the, the way that he caused those problems being a beacon to the slaves and the black people in Haiti uh, to rise up against. Uh, their colonial oppressors. And what we see in Nanny de Maroon, firewoman struggle, hopeful stream to Freedom River. Again, the, import, the important positive metaphors of the sort of the flame burning as in firewoman and then this idea of stream and river, something flowing and natural um, and, and leading to the sea, which, is, which is, has connotations here of, of freedom. So again, the really positive influence of Nanny de Maroon and her and her who she was on her people, and then again at the bottom of the stanza on uh, um, Mary Seacole, the idea of her being a star, so again a shining something shining out, a yellow sunrise, um, a rebirth and positivity uh, to those people dying, Th those people who may have even looked at her initially with sort of racial connotations. She was this this star, this sunrise to those people. Uh, creating hope um, and so I think that we can see a real shift in the way that language is used in these stanzas by Agard in order to influence us the reader. Now we come to the last uh, two lines of the poem and I think this really is about what's the message of the poem um, and what I, Agard is saying for me is that finally he's allowing he's being allowed to take control over his own ideas about his identity and what he says is he's, cre he's creating himself anew. He's carving himself. Now, the, the verb here to carve is to create something from something else. And so there is this original Agard, this, this British-educated, white-educated Agard. And from his engagement with Caribbean black history, 
what he's doing is he's carving himself new from that old a god creating himself new with this new knowledge that he now has uh, and, and that allows him to be more of the john a god that he wants more of the identity that he wants ownership of and less of that identity that's been imposed on him um, throughout his life and education um, so uh, that is just a brief initial look at checking out my history i hope it was helpful and that it allows you to now engage with the poem in a deeper and more meaningful way